I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. Here we are, Lifestylist Podcast. Joy, welcome to the show. Oh, you're so welcome. Yeah, this is uh, this is great. Yeah, I'm glad we were able to do this in person. As you know, uh, I'm leaving town, uh, hence the junk all over the house and the studio here. And uh, we had gone back and forth a little bit trying to nail down a date. And I just did not want to do this on Zoom, especially after having come to your clinic the other day and had the stem cell treatment and looked at your whole operation. I just wanted to sit down with you in person. So I'm glad you made time. Thank you. Yeah, this is a pleasure. And I get to meet this precious friend. You got your co-host, Cookie yeah. Man. She looks extremely happy co-host to be there. Co-host Cookie. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so let's jump right in. Um, and for those interested, somewhere on my Facebook page, you can see the stem cell procedure that we did at uh, Joy's office. So that was there. But I'm curious how you gravitated as a doctor toward the anti-aging medicine and all of the regenerative stuff and the cutting edge kind of medicine technology that you're into. Yeah, maybe I'll just give you a quick overview of my journey. So I actually grew up in China. Uh, first, My first 20 years was in Beijing. And so when growing up in the Chinese system, there's always a sense that you could use Chinese medicine when necessary and you can use... Uh, Western medicine, when necessary, each are good for certain things. Nothing is perfect for everything. So there's already a sense that that you utilize whatever that works, right? So the, an, an integration, you know, like in my mom's, you know, medicine drawer. There's Western medicine, Chinese medicine. Everything's mixed together. And she asked me, "What, you know, what's your symptom?" After I tell her, and she will have her diagnosis, and she will reach out and either it's Chinese medicine or Western medicine. So she pull out whatever magic it is. Uh, so that's kind of my background. And when I came here, eventually deciding to go into medicine. Um, I well, I decided to go into psychiatry because I was fascinated by the brain, and then I, you know, I got board certified in psychiatry and later on addiction medicine. Uh, but you know, I've tried to be integrative in my approach in treating patients, but I saw the limitation in the system in what what was done, and I was trying very hard to integrate, you know, what I've learned from Chinese medicine with the Western psych- psychiatric approach. Uh, but those two are such vastly different languages, and I had trouble uh, really truly integrate them. And when I encountered what's called anti-aging medicine, which is really an offshoot of functional medicine um, or integrative medicine, there are many names for it. But basically, these the whole new branch of medicine comes you know, the, the, their essence is about looking at the body as a whole. So the whole body has many, many, many things working uh, together, including various nutrition, how that affects your body, um, how hormones are affecting your body. What about toxicity? That That's, you know, how is that interacting? What about, you know, the different organs, how they affect other organs? So everything becomes a system approach. And this whole branch of medicine not only is looking at things holistically like Chinese medicine, but it's using modern scientific language to explain how different systems may be connected. So all of a sudden in my mind, all the dots are getting connected. So I could use a holistic approach looking at the body as a whole, but with scientific language to integrate this, this you know, how I can look at the disease and how the therapeutic you know, treatments can come together. And that's when I just, you know, had a hot moment, you know, this is what I need to do. This is, you know, I could be holistic, but still be scientific. Um, And then, so anti-aging, you know, the beauty of anti-aging medicine, um, some people don't like the, the, the name for it, but really it's, it's a beautiful concept because it's about looking at aging as a prequel to disease. And really it, it is a the prequel to, to disease. Because when you have disease, it's more like, let's say a body is like a house. And you, when you are diagnosed with disease or you show symptoms, that's like the house is caught on fire. You, you've seen, you know, things are, but, you know, things aren't re- really happening. Smokes are coming out. But guess what? Before the smokes are coming out, the fire got caught on. Things are happening. Things are smoldering. And that's what has not been picked up by our Western medicine approach. They're only waiting for you to get sick. That's entire my entire medical education. You know, I went to a great school, UCLA, and they're, you know, fairly forward thinking. But still, the entire medical education is about waiting for the patient to get sick. Let's just wait for people to get sick. 
And then we'll have all these sophisticated diagnostic criteria, you know, this imaging and all these things. And we'll figure out what's causing the sickness. And then we throw drugs, you know, give them drugs or do surgery. That's the entire approach. But what if you catch the little smoldering things before the smoke comes out? And that's the philosophy of anti-aging medicine. You prevent the, the, what's causing the disease because what's causing the disease is also what's causing aging. It's they're, they're hand in hand. When we are older, we get sicker. And they, they just come together because your cells are getting older, getting dysfunctional. It can't recognize cancer very well. It can't fight diseases very well. You, you, your, your tissues are fibrosed and it's not being replaced by new tissue sufficiently. That's why everything starts to break down. So if you prevent the breakdown, then you can prevent disease. So what a beautiful model to help people live healthy a healthy life, right? It's not about, oh, we're fighting aging. No, we're making people living a vibrant life and prevent them from getting sick. And so you can gracefully age and enjoy this wonderful health. But eventually one problem with life is that we are all going to die, right? Why do we, we, why do we have to die? Maybe one day we're going to prevent that. But right now uh, we know that people run out of stem cells. So just look at if we are degenerating, degenerating, you know, things are running, you know, running low on fuel and, and then you're not replacing, you're not replacing any of these damaged cells. Then guess what? You just, you know, wrinkles start to show, you know, hair start to gray and then, you know, all the functions you can't see in the, in, in the inside of the body, your organs are also, you know, are also degenerating. You just don't see it. All you see is the outside and you think, oh, I'm aging, but guess what? You're aging everywhere. So one reason you're aging like that is because your body cannot replace the damaged cells. So all your cells are getting older and your body's just not keeping up replacing the damaged cells. Um, so uh, why do we die? Well, if you run out of stem cells to replace all the damaged cells, you know, all the cells that are not functioning very well, then your organs, you know, just start to not functioning very well. You know, eventually everything shuts down. So that is you know, we're looking at what can we do to prevent that? So stem cells is one of the tricks. If we can replace those messages. We're definitely going to get into that. A couple of questions came up though during your um, answer. And one, I find it's interesting that in China, it's not an either or with traditional herbalism and, you know, the pharmaceutical allopathic route. I find that really interesting because here, outside of you know, functional medicine and the, the types of medicine that you practice and that you mentioned. But if you go to your average, you know, family doctor or specialist, it's very rare that they're going to say, hey, try this herb or medicinal mushroom or something like that. That's just not in their lexicon. And I know from experience, if I mentioned to a doctor, oh, you know, I've had this thing going on and I'm taking this herb and it seems to help. Do you have any other recommendations? They look at me like I'm insane for mentioning an herb. Like there's just, there's no possibility that anything that grows out of the ground naturally could ever help you, which is, which is funny. <laughs> but in China, it's, it, it, you know, I, from what you say, then the, you know, the ancient, ancient Chinese system of medicine then is still revered and considered um, legitimate in, in the oh, medical yeah. field? I mean, there's a huge book, I think written at like 5,000 years ago, is categorizing all these herbs and their medicinal qualities. And it is, it is very comprehensive. So Chinese medicine kept evolving. Of course, you know, it, you know, it works very well. You can see how many Chinese there are. Um, but the, the, the integration is about um, looking at your body as a whole. In Western medicine, if you have something wrong with your eyes, then they just look at your eyes. But the Chinese medicine, they will sense your pulse and you, they will look at your tongue. They will look at your entire constitution and they will decide uh, what system, what organ systems. They talk about systems. Like for example, the eye is, has the meridian runs through the eye and the liver. So it's all connected. It could be something wrong with your liver. So if you co correct this whole system energy flow, then your eyes can heal. So, but same person, different people with same, same, seemingly same eye problem may have different constitutions. They have entire different, um, just, just the way their body operates. So they may have problems with different energy systems. So it's someone presenting, two people presenting, presenting with the same sim symptom. When the Chinese medicine doctor is diagnosing them, the, the diagnosis could be completely different because 
it's according to each person's what's going on with that person because you're looking at the body as a whole. So they may give them completely different herbs and they, they, you know, they can cure the same problem. But it, that, that's the thing, that they're looking at entire body in a very, very different way. They don't focus on just what's surfacing. Well said. That totally makes sense because I, I can see how uh, in our system here, yeah, if you go in and you're having a problem with your eye, there's never going to be a discussion about anything else other than some drops or drugs that we can give you to alleviate the symptom. That's very interesting. Uh, also interesting that it seems here that part of the um, kind of the internal error in the system is that medical education, training, et cetera, is so deeply intertwined with pharmaceutical companies, right? So even if a doctor is open-minded, let's say, and just does the Western medicine path, goes to med school, and, and there maybe they take some herbs at home and they're aware of these things to some degree, they're not incentivized at all to offer that information to patients, right? Because you've got to you know, have your medical office and your staff and there's a huge overhead and you've got medical bills from med school, I'm assuming, that go on for years and you want to make some cash, right? And so, you know, it, it, the this system, is- it seems to be built around surgeries, which make a lot of money and pharmaceutical drugs. So how is there not that same sort of conflict of interest then in the Chinese yeah. medical system? Well, it's so steeped. I mean, you know, it doesn't have this money making kind of a realm. There's individual, it's like this individual practitioners of Chinese medicine, these old Chinese medicine doctors. They see you, you know, you probably pay them a fee and then they write your prescription of all these herbs. And then you go to the pharmacy who have all these herbs and then they will measure different herbs and give you a packet. So it's a low cost system. You know, it doesn't, the, the herbs, right? Or the whatever from insects, it just come from the earth, from the ground. It doesn't, it, there's no patent. There's nothing, you know, it, it doesn't, some cause a lot, some don't, but the system, it's, it's, it has its own balance. Whereas here, the cost is astronomical, right? So, you know, people are interested in medical history, you know, the U.S. used to have different medical systems, including homeopathy. Of course, the, the, the osteopaths, you know, are allowed to maintain, but, you know, the chiropractic, you know, everything else was squeezed, you know, kind of outside of mainstream. So there's this monopoly of what medicine is. Um, so I was educated in the, within the system and definitely, you know, very wrapped in it because that's all I was told. So if you don't look outside, then you're living forever in your own little bubble. So the bubble is, const, you know, you know, composed of, yes, pharmaceutical company, companies producing drugs and making huge profit from it, right? And then they also have significant influence on FDA, who are supposed to be approving the drugs. And, uh, but um, a lot of the FDA officials, after they finish their tenure at, 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 you know, at, at the FDA, then they go on to become executives in pharmaceutical companies. <laughs> right, and right. FDA, a lot of funding comes from the pharmaceutical companies. And, right. and then they also have this control over medical education because they support a lot of the funding of the medical education. So, you know, then you need to talk about things that they're happy with, right? You don't want to go too far outside of this realm and telling them that don't use any drugs. I mean, that beats the whole purpose, right? Why would they be funding the medical education? And then, so we finished medical school four years, right? We're all in this bubble and you finally left medical school. And guess what? You're required to do continuing medical education, you know, to earn your credits so that you can continue your license. And then you do that through um, a lot of times going to conferences, and conferences, you earn credit, you take courses. And guess who funds those conferences? Who are putting up the money? Who, you know, the, the, so, so it, you, you, it, you literally get kept in this bubble. And, and, and then the insurance company is in on it, right? So if you prescribe drugs, then the insurance company will cover. So there's this, this togetherness between the pharmaceutical com- company and the insurance company. And I saw that, you know, very... Vividly, when I was a medical director of a few rehab centers in Malibu, and uh, I was very much trying to do this integrative approach. So I was trying to check people's nutrition, their hormones, and if we, if I could give them a natural substance to help harmonize their body, build up their body, and repair their their, their system that's driving 
the cravings and addiction behavior, you know, then I feel like I'm, I'm making fundamental changes. I'm not just covering up the symptoms, right? I'm trying to heal the person. Um, but a lot of times, by the time I say, okay, this supplement will help you, this will help you. Uh, the patient comes back to me saying, um, you know what, doctor, what, can you just give me a drug? Because the insurance company doesn't cover the supplements. So I right. really don't, I don't have the money to pay for the supplements and it just, you know, adds up, you know, it, uh, it would be cheaper. Can you just write a drug? So it was very discouraging for me because I'm really trying to heal from the sources, you know, from the root problems and the system was defeating me in a way, defeating my attempts. Wow. Yeah. I know that story. I wish you would have been my doctor when I was in rehab. <laughs> Not that I could have afforded the supplements, but oh man. See? <laughs> but I mean, you know, so many things. I mean, it's been a, a lot of years since uh, since I checked myself into a rehab, but uh, almost 24, it'll be 24 years on Monday, actually. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. But, uh, you know, I think of just all the mood swings and just just had a terrible time emotionally for the first few years until I got into alternative health and all the things that I guess what they call biohacking now. And then I started to kind of unlock um, those uh, barriers to fulfillment, just physical balance, you know, but it took a long time. Yeah. And no one, no one was talking about that. It was like, everyone's drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes, eating sugar. That's, that's the rec early recovery diet, you know, which is the worst shit you should ever yes, do yeah. if you're trying yeah. to get your neurotransmitters and right. hormones, you know, you're on track. You're just keeping yeah. up the poison. Yeah. So imagine if the insurance company had covered supplements. It's cheap, right? It doesn't cost much money at all. Compared to drugs, it's nothing. Yeah. If they had done that and allowed this new kind of medicine to flourish. And I can tell you as a doctor, as somebody that graduated from medical school, you know, even at UCLA, I had about half an hour of education on nutrition. So, and then I pretty much, I don't think they taught us anything. Maybe there's altogether less than 15 minutes of supplements. I, I mean, we don't know anything about supplements. We don't, which simply, just like, oh, some people are using that. They say that, you know, but there's no evidence. So, so the, the, when they say there's no evidence, they're just not looking at the evidence. And, when, and then when they're talking about, yeah, because people have been used for thousands of years, right? Their research yeah. studies in all these different countries, but they don't want to look at it because it's not important. This is not part of their purpose. This whole education, that's not the purpose. And when, 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 so when we, um, you know, when we entrust our doctors to check, you know, on, on the supplements bottle, always say, consult with your physician before you take the supplements. You know, that's more yeah. for liability. Guess what? When you take this to your physician, what they will do, they'll be like, oh, okay, I'll get back to you on this because they have no idea what's going on there. They don't know what it is and how it interacts with medications. When you leave, they will go on the internet and start looking up this herb. What the hell is it? And how, is there any interactions with what I'm prescribing? That's how you clear with the physicians. They don't know. Wow. Okay. Good stuff. Well, <laughs> I have in my... Hey, I just give it to people straight. No, I love it. I love your passion. And anyone that listens to this show on a regular basis is going to be somewhat familiar with this whole system. Uh, I had in my notes here, you know, sometimes I'll have something that's not the main topic I wanted to talk about, and then it slips through the cracks and I don't get to ask it. So this one in my show notes here actually put something that I... I was very curious about actually, aside from the stem cells and ketamine and stuff that I want to get into with you. But it's this um, Chara Omni lotion that you created. And that's how I first found you. Someone, I think, in your PR or something reached out, hey, you want to try this lotion? And I'm like, yeah, sure, send it over. You know, I'll try it out. And, um, you know, I get sent a lot of stuff. I'm very grateful to be in the position I'm in. People send me things to try all the time. And I thought, um, you know, whatever, it's another lotion, I'll throw it in the drawer. But I looked at the ingredients and there were things in there that I've never seen in a face lotion. And I also saw that it was pretty expensive, you know, more so than your average like organic lotion at Whole Foods or something. Um, and what I noticed in there were peptides and stem cells. And that was very interesting. But there were a number of other ingredients and I want to cover some of them with you. But this stuff is just incredible. And so I wanted to give you props for the formulation and just kind of find out how that came to be. Because I covet this stuff. I mean, I don't need... Allison doesn't even know I have it. You know, like, I was over <laughs> in my little corner. I have it in my little medicine cabinet. And I take like every night, I take a tiny, tiny little bit, like this, I don't know, the size of like 
four pieces of rice and I put it, you know, just on these fingers and I just put it on my eyes because I'm I don't want to waste it with the rest of my dumb face. I, I, this is where the wrinkles happen, you know what I mean? Um, but in this stuff, you've got this uh, Wharton's jelly extract, um, amniotic extracellular matrix, peptides, uh, hyaluronic acid, grapeseed oil, evening primrose oil, honeysuckle flower, aloe vera leaf extract. That one I know, I would put that in a lotion. Chamomile extract, white tea leaf extract, CoQ10, tocopherol, and alpha lipoic acid. And a lot of those, like the the last three are things that I take as supplements. I eat them and I never would think like, oh, I'll put CoQ10 on my face. So I kind of wanted to just talk about why that stuff works so well and how you formulated it and what stem cells do when you actually put them on your body externally yeah, versus so inside. As far as stem cells, I mean, the, the cells are not going to be alive, you know, in the, in the product, you know, once you know, the cells has to be kept in a particular condition. So once this is, you know, processed in the cream, but what's special about the product is that, you know, there are agents that are used to help uh, let, you know, basically have the cell membrane, re, you know, break down and release, uh, all the internal components, which are full of growth factors. So the, it's abundance of growth factors and exosomes. So all these things are, are embedded, but it's from the Wharton's jelly, which is the gelatinous material in the umbilical cord. So it's full of these highly, highly therapeutic and, and regenerative uh, uh, molecules. So, so it's, it's those that gets released and that in combination with peptides that are specifically great for anti-inflammation and uh, anti-wrinkle and and uh, and also collagen promoting kind of peptides. Um, so the reason I came up with the you know the the, the cream really initially was kind of for myself because I got frustrated with trying to find a good cream. Um, you know, I'm all about anti-aging, you know, like I was talking about how I do, you know, IV stem cells every three months. Um, but I, I, you know, and I want to put something on my face that's really, really healthy, right? I don't want anything that has any toxic substances. And uh, so I try to get organic ones and things that are just fully natural. And I realized that that they weren't as the, the you know either the texture was not that great or when I look at an ingredients it's not completely natural it's like you just said it's fully natural but this is what's this what's this so I realized that that that's not really fully natural and the fully fully natural ones um, I may get a sample when I go to a trade show you know this fully organic natural and I leave it in my drawer for like a month or two before I get to it by the time I get to it it's has different layers. So there was like, oh, I don't think I feel comfortable putting this on my face. They've already segregated this. You know, I'm not sure this is stable. So, so I was, it was frustrating. Um, so I thought, you know, I, I, you know, I have all this, you know, knowledge, right. I, I mean, I want something that's hundred percent natural and I have, you know, access to the most regenerative components, which is the umbilical cord, you know, with, with all this incredible, incredible molecules that in our body, it just that we don't have much anymore. So we can use that and use the power of peptides, which are just natural little fragments of, um, of amino acids that sense particular potent signals. So these, you know, that's naturally occurring peptides. So if we put those together and add all these natural ingredients that have the ability to clear the skin, you know, cle skin cleansing, um, providing the antioxidants and promote collagen production, and, um, and, and, you know, even out skin tone and, and, and you know, shrinking pore. I mean, there are all these, there's a lot of ingredients. So how we can put all these incredible things together and, and we even have prebiotics, right? Helping the healthy bacteria, you know, that, and so prebiotics and, um, and a lot of natural oils that are highly nourishing for the skin. So putting them all together and, um, and, and, and of course, when I tried it, I just, you know, it, it was the best cream I've ever had just because I use it morning and night. And, you know, once you put it on, you will know that it's going to be hydrated and, perf you know, perfect texture for the entire entire day until you want to do it, you know, at night because I do it twice a day. Um, so, so that's really how it came about. Um, so I really think it's the best cream there is. I haven't seen anything like it. I I'm, I'm going to, I mean, that's why I brought it up. Honestly, it really is. And I'm not, I mean, I'm a guy, so I'm not that picky. If I run out of like face oil, I'll just put coconut oil on my face or whatever. Like, you know what I mean? I'm not p particularly 
picky, but I just noticed like, oh my God, when I put this stuff on, my face feels really, it just feels really good. Especially at night, like before I go to bed, it's really relaxing yeah. on my eyes. And Oh yeah. I have people telling me their fine lines were going away within three weeks. Also dark spots, you know, certain, certain defects were also going away. So it's, uh, and some were saying like, what's in this? What, what, what? <laughs> this, this is crazy. What did you put in this? Just allowing your skin to heal on its own. Well, the question that I had when uh, someone from your team reached out when I saw the stem cells and then looked into it and it said the um, um, umbilical stem cells. And I was like, oh, are these from abortions? And I emailed them back. I was like, I said, actually, you know what? Before I said, yeah, I said it over. I said, I just have one question. If this is from like aborted babies, I can't participate in that uh, situation. And they assured me, no, it's not. And I just believed them, you know, because it seemed like a legitimate company. The website looks real and everything. Um, And as we get into the stem cell thing, how does the process of getting stem cells from umbilical cords during the birth process happen? Oh, yeah. We do not. We do not deal. I I don't even know who. Yeah. I have no contact with any clinics that does abortion. I I, I don't even know. I mean, I, I don't think... I, you know, that's not even a realm that I connected with. Yeah. So, you know, the way that these birth tissue are coll- collected is when a mother is about to give birth, um, they're asked, do you want to uh, save the tissue and, you know, have it processed and stored for future use for your baby? Or uh, so basically 90% of the time, mothers say no, because it costs a few thousand dollars, you know, to keep it every year. So they could get it encapsulated or something like that? No, and no. So how does it work if they want to save it? How does it So how usually it they save the blood, they can process it, which means that they will, you know, separate out the, 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 the red blood cells from the, the more premature cells. So the stem cell portion, you know, the premature, you know, very young premature cells, or, or uh, so those cells are kept and then they are cryopreserved and saved, you know, basically put in liquid nitrogen so then they can be used, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later. So By it's the basically, same person? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so, so, so one could have a baby, elect to have them preserved in that way. And exactly. then when the baby's 17 years old and gets in a soccer accident and busts his ass, exactly. <laughs> yeah, put or his have own a, stem cells back yeah, in. Yeah, or have a traumatic brain injury, you know, all of a sudden they, they can't walk and you can inject the cells and, and restore their function. Or the person could be diagnosed with some other, you know, terrible illness or, or you know, God forbid, leukemia, you know, things like that. Then you can use the same cells to repopulate the body, the same healthy ones. Um, so, so it used to be people were only preserving cord blood cells. And then real, they realized that cord tissue have you know, a tremendous amount of uh, mesenchymal stem cells, which is really kind of the engine cells for regeneration. So then people started to process cells and store cells from the cord tissue. So then local cord, you can either get the blood out or you can dissect the tissue and get get the cells mostly from Orton's jelly, you know, free the cells up and then store them. So, but it costs a lot of money and a lot of, you know, families may not be willing to do that. And then they're asked, um, if you're not going to preserve it, would you like to donate it? Um, So once they say they are willing, um, they have to fill out this very, very extensive questionnaire. And it was almost 90 questions. Um, So it asks questions about their, um, you know, personal, you know, their health history, their um, their work history, so toxic exposures, their travel history, their sexual history, um, their you know prenatal history, their partner's history, you know the entire family history. So they look at everything. And one thing about donation of these these tissue is is a true donation. You cannot be compensated in any way. You know you can't be given a pen. You know you you're not going to be able to be mm-hmm. awarded any way. Um, this is truly that you are willing to donate. So this kind of prevent people from lying on this form just so that they could get, you know, their tissue accepted. Uh, Because the reason you can't give them anything is because it is illegal to sell human tissue. So you you can't sell human tissue in this country. Um, It has to be a donation. Uh, So after the sell, these products, um, well, after they fill out the form and they fit, fulfill the criteria. So different companies may have different criteria. Our company, we have one of the most stringent criteria. So anything that's suspicious, you know, this, the, the, the cells are not going to be accepted. So after they agree to donate and their questionnaire meets 
the 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 criteria, then um, of course they they have to have their uh, prenatal uh, uh, follow up. You know, all their history and and everything has to look good. And on the day of delivery, they have to be in perfect health, and the baby has to be healthy. So it has to be. So even if they have have a low degree fever, that's scrapped. They can't donate. That that's it. The, you know, we're not going to accept it. So it has to be a good delivery, and the delivery actually has to be cesarean section, uh, and not it has to be elective cesarean section. The reason they do that is not to allow the baby to go through the vaginal canal, which is dirty, which you know, has a lot of bacteria, and, uh, and 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 so when you come through that canal, things can easily get contaminated. Whereas if you do cesarean section, you're opening the person up, everything is sterile, and then you take the tissue, right? You take the baby out and then you, you know, cut the cord and there's a placenta and then you can save this birth tissue, right? Usually this birth tissue is going to be tossed in the trash in the biological waste. But when these people are willing to donate and they meet the criteria, then the procurement company would put the tissue, you know, carefully in a sterile bag, you know, put on ice and then send it over overnight it to labs, whichever lab that's going to process this. Um, and so the lab, once they accept the tissue, they, they receive the tissue, they have to do testing to check lots of, basically they go through the same stringent testing that an organ transplant donation is going through. So you have to check for hepatitis, HIV, you know, syphilis, and, you know, a, a, a lot of, you know, a, 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 all the conditions that are, are, are tested for organ transplant. And, you know, our company actually go above and beyond tests even more, including Lyme disease and Chagas and prion disease and all, all that stuff. So once you test everything, um, you can process the, the cells, you can, you know, start processing. But if the test comes positive for any conditions, then that has to be tossed. You you know, that's not to be used. So, but if everything looks good and you, you process the cells and you have a finished product, Right, so you you may have cryopreserved the product, uh, and then the finished product is sent out to an outside lab to test for sterility. So is the is the product sterile? Did you have contamination during your processing? Um, so they have to grow this, the, the you know to to grow to see if any bacteria anything grows, and they have to test for endotoxins. So basically, toxins released by the bacteria, and that would take a couple of weeks to come back. And so when that comes back negative. So, you know, when everything is cleared, that means then this product can be used to, for human use. You can actually give to people. If that comes back negative, you know, but, or come back positive, you know, basically is no good, then they have tossed the whole batch. Um, unfortunately, there are some unscrupulous companies, which I would not name, uh, who did not wait until the final result comes back. And they are so eager to sell the product. They just sold it. And then result came back showing that there are bacteria, contamination. And then what? And then they scramble, right? But some people are already hurt. Wow. Damn. Well, yeah. so, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear this now after you gave me an IV of these stem cells the other day. <laughs> I mean, I looked on your website and you sent me that really comprehensive PDF ahead of time. And, you know, I, I had my questions and all of that. But I, I felt confident and my gut check on it was like, this this girl's legit. This She's not messing around. You seem, you know, very... Um, integrous about what you do. So that's why I was comfortable with that. But still there is, it's a little uneasy for some reason, still just putting something from another person's body, a, you know, a mother or baby's body in your body. And I was afterward, like did have a couple of thoughts, like, I don't know, what if their DNA was mutated or, yeah, you know, I if, wanna... I, if I got like remnants of a mutant vaccine that they had, or, you know, just weird thoughts like that. And I thought, well, people get blood transfusions all the time. Like I go donate blood you know, every few months um, to be a good person and to get iron out of my body. And um, so someone ha is walking around with my blood in them, probably walking around LA, a bunch of people. <laughs> well, your point, blood, you know? you know, your red blood cells do not have DNA in it. So, so these cells do have DNA, but you know, um, the function of these cells, it's, it, it's almost, it, it, in a sense, it goes to your to body, it does its thing and most of them go away. But it's, it's the, the million dollar question of how much of the cells actually stay in my body, right? Because a lot of times to fix certain tissue, we want the cells to stay and make new cells. But that's really, initially, that's what people thought stem cells are functioning. They thought 
Stem cell therapy is by giving the stem cells to the body so the stem cells can divide and form the new tissue. And that's how the person you know, gets, gets benefits. And then as we go through years and years of research and, and, and clinical study and realizing, oh, I guess the benefit is not so much about the cells becoming part of the human tissue. It's really the cells that are send, sending out signals. And most of them don't stay in the body, but the benefit is there. So it's really about these cells giving out signals, the right, the right information. It's like a disseminating information. So, Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so I've asked some of the most prominent scientists you know, around the world, it's like how much of these cells actually stay in the body, right? I'm doing the therapy, I'm giving it to people. So how much actually stay? Nobody, they're like, nobody knows, nobody knows. But I think the consensus I've been getting is between two to 5%. So what, whatever I gave you, maybe two to 5% actually stays. So I want to kind of give you also, uh, you know, uh, allay some of the, the fears or, or the concerns that you might have, other people have. For example, I have done IV transplantation on myself every three months, right? So I have lots of people's DNA in me. And what I want people to realize is that what's called, actually there's a name for it called microchimerism. So chimera, it means to, uh, Two, two animals or two things are becoming one, one organism, right? So microchimerism is, you know, it's happening on a small scale. And that is prevalent in nature that happens all the time, even in humans. And one typical example is what's happening in a woman's body. So first they found out from a Harvard study, they did an autopsy on these old women who died, right? That they're old. And then they were dissecting their brain and they're looking at the DNA in the brain. And the easiest way to find out if there's any foreign DNA is by testing the Y chromosome, right? The female X chromosome and male Y chromosomes. So there should be no reason that there's Y chromosome in a female body, right? And guess what? They found out all these women who have given birth to male children have Y chromosomes in their brain. So that's the first thing. And, and, and incidentally, uh, they actually found out that the Y chromosomes, the presence of that actually was protective against Alzheimer's. But, but that was you know, maybe the, the, the number of uh, subjects were not sufficient to, to draw that conclusion. But that was interesting, right? Because we all know when a woman that has uh, these autoimmune conditions, often their conditions get better when, when they're pregnant. That's, that's a known fact in, in, in the medical community. So why are they getting better during pregnancy? Could it be that they're getting a mini stem cell transfusion from the baby? Because we know there's exchange of communication, right? This communication and even cellular material. So, so obviously the male or even the female just can't tell, right? So even when you have give, you know, given birth to females um, as a woman, doesn't mean that there's no exchange. We just, we, we're able to tell really easily whether or not the males has got into the female's body. So, so when you are having, carrying this baby, there's exchange. The mother cells, the baby cells, but, you know, the, the, it got into the, the mother because later on, what they found out is is the the cells, the Y chromosomes, uh, because that's what they used to test, are not just in the brain; it's in the breast; it's basically in all the tissue, everywhere. So, so that already happens in nature. And then there's a follow up study, which is fascinating because they found out that 60 percent of women actually have Y chromosomes in them, and so they couldn't account that um, account for that by the, you know, just having, having been pregnant with male children it, because it's sort of looking at what if um, they had a pregnancy, um, but it was a miscarriage and they didn't know about. So they, they statistically, they're, they're looking at that, adding that into the factor, you know, and then they're also adding the factor. Oh, what if they were in the mother's womb, you know, when they were, you know, little fetus and there were a male sibling that, but no one knew about that the sibling died you know, in utero. So what if we account for that? So they were adding all these potential factors to see if they could count for the 60% of Y chromosomes in women's body. They couldn't. So the only conclusion, you know, the author was saying, well, I think the only way we could explain it is through male and female intercourse. Really? Yes. Wow. So, so isn't that enlightening? Like, why didn't my mind go there? <laughs> I, was, uh, I was waiting for the, the 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 answer to the riddle, and I'm like, that's so obvious, you know. But yeah, so so it already happens in nature all the time because a baby and the mother, their DNA is only fifty percent identical, right? So you have a foreign DNA, right? Completely foreign, but because they're so young, they're able to go inside, stay in the body, 
and be adapted to the, the new body. If the baby had grown up because of the 50% difference, the, the baby could, if you have a, let's say a transplantation, let's say a bone marrow transplant, if, if your, your baby gives you transplant, where you as a mother, sometimes you can't give, you can't donate to your baby or the baby cannot donate to the mother because the baby has grown because they've expressed all these surface receptors and they've established their own identity. But when the cells are so young and you put in that person's body, it actually adapts. It, it speaks a different language. Oh, uh, okay. So it's the, really fascinating. So, so the stem cells are not differentiated yet. They're just a blank exactly. palette and they've not expressed as yeah. whatever they're going to be, tissue, yeah. whatever. This oh, is why it's really fascinating because people have done uh, core blood transplantation, right? Umbilical core blood uh, in lieu of uh, bone marrow transplantation. So if someone has leukemia, you can give them from a perfectly matched donor and take their bone marrow and, and transfuse it and, and, and allow the cells to establish in the new person in, in their own bone marrow. Or you can give umbilical core blood. The, the composition is very similar. So umbilical core blood, um, when you don't, when they did experiments, you don't, you don't test for, you, you don't match anything. The HLA markers, you don't match it. Completely unmatched. You have way less potential for any problems than a perfectly matched adult, perfectly HLA matched adult bone marrow transplant because our cells are so complex, right? There are all these surface re- uh, markers. Just because you tested the main, the major HLA markers, there's so, still many you didn't test. But, but because the cells are so mature, it has all these everything's manifested. And then you put in another person's body, guess what? They're, they don't get along. There's, you know, the body doesn't recognize, but completely unmatched. You don't, you, you don't even bother testing it and you put in the new person. There's very, very little problems. Wow. Okay, cool. So from talking to you the other day, uh, briefly, and we did a little pre-interview, but for those that don't see that, I'll go ahead and kind of recap it now. Uh, I was expressing that I had had stem cell treatment a few years back out with uh, Dr. Harry Adelson and Dr. Amy Killen in uh, Park City, um, Doceri Clinics. And for that procedure, which by the way, for anyone watching is on YouTube, it's <laughs> extremely gory because it was a, it's a legit surgery. Like when I went with you the other day, it was just like getting a Myers cocktail, like an IV. It was just totally chill. You're going to drip in your arm and you just sit there and hang out. But this was uh, you know, under anesthesia and they did um, adipose-derived stem cells and bone marrow-derived stem cells. So you know this, but I'll explain to the audience. So what they did is they took basically what was the equivalent of um, doing liposuction on my like back fat, I guess, kind of in my back, like a muffin top around the back side <laughs> of the muffin. And uh, you know, really gory on video from what I hear. I'll never watch it. Um, and then they take you know, the fat or blood out of there, whatever it is, get your own stem cells. And then they went into that, what's that bone called on your butt? Like that plate hit your hip yeah, bone on the, the backside? The iliac, iliac quest. Yeah, yeah. That's usually... So they basically took like an ice pick with the hammer, hit a big hole in that and then extracted the bone marrow out of there, went in a centrifuge and spun it or whatever and extracted my own stem cells and then put them back into me all over my body. When I say all over, I mean all over, even the places you're thinking they wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's Amy's special. Amy does the sexual, uh, you know, um, enhancement or whatever. Um, so yes, my penis was injected with stem cells on YouTube. Um, I think it's behind a little sheet. Hopefully, or it probably would have been banned by now. But anyway, I did that, and uh, and I saw some improvement in, in in a couple of the things. I mean, I was hoping for like a one two punch, and my twenty year back pain would just be gone in three months, and it hasn't been. I'm still working on it. I'm I'm making some progress. Uh, but I think it was a net positive experience, and I'm glad I did it. But it was pretty invasive. I mean, you're you know you're kind of laid up for a couple of days, and you know you got to take pain meds, and it was definitely not an easy experience. Uh, but I think for someone who has a serious, long-standing injury, there's a lot of evidence to support that either of those methods can be useful. But when I talked to you, you had some different opinions about that, which is why you're doing it in the way you do it with the umbilical stem cells. So. Can you break down uh, at least your perspective on the um, adipose derived and bone marrow derived, um, the um, endogenous versions of that, and then give us kind of an overview of what's happening outside of the United States where the laws are more lax and other places where people are uh, multiplying and culturing stem cells. So you get a net, you know, 
benefit of having more. And you said that it's possible that might not even be a benefit. Kind of break that down for people that are okay. uh, you know, somewhat aware that there are kind of three different types of stem cells that you can put in your cell. Right. So the, those are the three most common types, obtaining stem cells from your bone marrow, your fat, or using someone else's, which most likely is from the birth tissue. Um, so when I first got into, you know, got super excited about stem cells, I definitely looked into all of them. And because I was determined to give people the best. Um, so by reading a ton of articles and looking at research that's been done from all around the world, including direct comparisons between these tissue sources and looking at how potent the cells are, how safe they are, how, how, um, how, how much, how, how able, uh, how capable they are at differentiating into different pathways and how much anti-inflammatory factors they're able to secrete and how much you know, lifespan they have left. So I compared everything and there was no question in my mind that the birth tissue source is superior. I mean, that's not my conclusion. It's the conclusion of many, many, many scientists from all around the world. Um, so, so that is, is a given. Umbilical cord sores came as a younger kid on the block. So initially it was bone marrow because we were doing bone marrow transplants, um, you know, the, those, uh, you know, to, to help with leukemia before we knew about stem cell therapy. That was really the first stem cell therapy. Uh, so that was bone marrow. And then they, re- they realized, oh, bone marrow, if you break the bone and when you're, you know, doing orthopedic surgery and you put some marrow, you know, there and it actually helps it heal. So, so, so then that's how uh, the bone marrow started to, to become kind of like the gold standard for stem cell therapy. And then the fat derived source came onto the block. Um, and then they realized, oh, there are actually a lot of stem cells in the fat tissue. So it's not in the fat. It's really along the blood vessels that's nourishing the fat. Ah, okay. So it's, uh, there are all these mesenchymal stem cells that are kind of uh, you know huddling around the blood vessels. So they're separating out those cells and they found that they're very therapeutic. Um, and then you know, the birth tissue came to be and then they realized, oh, so these, are, they're just full of stem cells in this birth tissue. And that's really the engine, the, the placenta and umbilical cord, they were the engine of hum, forming a human being, right? So then they look at this, the stem cell composition. So the, the umbilical cord blood uh, is, has a very similar composition as the bone marrow. And the umbilical cord tissue, the MSCs, because it's full of MSCs, that's similar to kind of, you know, the, the, the fat derived product, which is full of MICs. So, so in a way, when you, when you are doing, you know, what I believe the best way is combine these two sources, right? If you can get what the best from the bone marrow and the best from the fat, um, and which is what you did, uh, very few people do both in, in, in one sitting. Um, but, but with the birth tissue, you could do that. So the cells are younger. Um, they cause less potential. Well, there's less potential for processing contamination, but but that that aside, you know, and it doesn't have doesn't cause any trauma. But that aside, um, it actually has less tumor promoting potentials. You know, people may think, oh, how you know my own cells? How is that going to happen? Guess what? Um, if you have any existing precancerous changes, you know, or a little little tumor that may be there, and your own stem cells are not very smart anymore. It's not as smart as birth tissue stem cells because when they've done direct comparisons, you put a, a tumor. They, they did it both in a petri dish and, and on a live animal. They put the tumor and then they put stem cells next to it. So if you use an adult human fat-derived stem cells, you put next to the tumor, the tumor grows because the cells is like, oh, I make people, I make things grow, right? I produce uh, <laughs> growth factors. I help I help everybody flourish. <laughs> and, and then so it made the tumor grow. But if you put umbilical cord derived stem cells next to this tumor, guess what? The tumor shrink and disappear. Wow. Damn. Because That's interesting. They have the extra intelligence that's still intact, is able to recognize, oh, oh, you are not supposed to be there. You don't belong. You're, you are pathological. So what it does, at least one of the mechanisms is secreting what's called a, a trail ligand. So this particular ligand actually cause uh, apoptosis of the cancer cells. Cell death, is that yeah. what that is? Okay. It programs cell death. It tells the tumor cells, you know what? Get on this path and die. So they still have that intelligence. That's why it's safer in that sense. There's less potential to actually exacerbate your own tumor or cancer. Wow. Um, so that not only is more effective, is more potent, 
but it's also safer. So why, and God bless all the, the doctors out there that are using stem cells um, derived in the way that I described, but why is anyone doing that still? Like what's, what's the argument on the other side in the stem cell world that we're, where people are still doing the, the bone marrow okay. and- Some people and are the, really, really going to dislike me and attack me, possibly even make comments under your, your post. <laughs> Sorry, right. it I'm, wouldn't be the first time. I am just going to speak the truth. Almost all stem cell therapy can have benefits, right? So a lot of the doctors who have used the treatment swear you know, that has helped their patients, which I believe wholeheartedly, just like it has helped you. It, it has- you know, it has helped people. So they've seen benefits. So then they're convinced that this works. This really helps. Um, and if they're not willing to look at newcomers, right, of new therapeutic modalities that possibly could be a step above, then they just want to use their own particular mode. The other reason is economic, economical concerns. Um, there's, an, there's an investment involved to have your own set up, right? Either bone marrow derived or fat derived. You've got, you need surgical apparatus. You have to go through some particular training. You're pay, paying a lot of money for the training and you've got all your, your staff, everybody's trained, you know, you're set up to do this, right? To switch gear means what, what about this? I just invested all this money. What, what, you know, what am I going to do with that? You know, I'm, oh, I'm right. getting good results. So I'm not going to switch gear. It makes no sense. You know, I'm good. So that's another factor that's preventing people from progressing from, you know, to me, I would, you know, I don't function that way. Um, to me, I feel an obligation to give people the very much, the very, the very best. So I, that's my moral obligation. You know, like I said last time, if I know that, you know, people are coming to me to get stem cell therapy and I know I can give them this thing that will give them you know, 70% benefit, like they, they can get great results, pretty good. But then I also know something else can give them 90%. So I, I cannot live with myself to give them the 70%. I just, I just can't. So um, I will do whatever I can to give them the one that will give them 90%. So if that means changing my business model, I'll change my business model. Well, it's interesting because, and that, and that makes sense. And if I had just dropped 150 grand, you know, creating a surgical environment and the centrifuge and all the things I'm sure that are necessary for that kind of extraction. Um, you know, I get that. But what's interesting is it seems that the cost to the patient is about the same. I mean, yes. you know, you're talking what, ten, fifteen thousand dollar range for a single treatment. Yes. And it seems about the same. So I don't know. It's like after hearing this, we might piss off some of the other doctors that are yeah. doing it the other way because if if you are the patient and you have that kind of cash well, um, I can and tell you're incentivized. You, I can tell you once everything is set up, it doesn't cost very much to do the procedure anymore. I mean, you have to pay the OR, you pay the nurse, um, you pay for your own time, uh, but it, it's not expensive to keep doing it anymore. But if you're buying it from a source, from a, a laboratory, then the cells are fairly expensive. So you have to pay for the product. So that's another reason. Maybe they're like, well, I'm recouping my, my investment and whatever I do from now on, I'm making great profit. So why Got spend it. the money to buy an expensive uh, product? Interesting. Ah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. That is very interesting. But I really respect the doctors who have done everything. They've done the bone marrow, they've done the fat, and then they are so open and they realize, oh my God, I didn't know that this birth tissue could be a better source for my patients. Not only that, nobody, you cannot be doing the anti-aging treatments that I'm doing on myself with your own tissue. First of all, you're depleting your stem cell source. And so you take it out of hibernation and you activate them and you put them in your body and they only live for about three months and then they're gone, right? So then you just depleted your own stem cell source. So... Um, and are you going to allow yourself to be liposuctioned or your bone drilled into every three months or six months? Hell Most people no. not, right? Besides, you know, you're just, you're just depleting, you're activating them. And so you're just getting less and less in your body. So, but when you're utilizing a source from a healthy newborn that has potent effects, potent therapeutic benefits, and you put in your body and in three months, they're pretty much gone, but you're not jeopardizing any of your own source. You're just ramping up this regeneration and then and then it's done, right? And then you can choose to do another one, you know, six months later or three months later, whatever you choose to keep up this level of regeneration of this useful, you know, upkeeping. Um, so, so that makes that possible. 
when you can get it from a standardized source. Right. And you were mentioning the other day that you had a theory and maybe there's evidence to back this up that when you're going through the surgical procedure of extraction and then say you do a stem cell IV, the systemic um, stem cell treatment, then because you just created a trauma because now you have a hole in your hip and your your glute and a hole in your you oh, know, yeah. back fat or whatever, then those stem cells are going to sequester to the injury because oh, that's me. what they do. Those, do you think those that's... areas you just hurt are screaming. They're sending out this this SOS signal saying, rescue me, help me heal. So your whole, your body's geared to, you know, galvanate to, to, to heal that tish, tissue. And the cells are exquisitely sensitive to those kind of signals. So any, any kind of s- signal of alarm of, you know, help me, um, you know, those, those molecules, those cytokines will actually be, you know, just, you know, th- they will talk to those stem cells. You just put back in your, to your body and the stem cells will, will, will swim right up to the area and start working right there. Um, so, you know, that's going to reduce the number of cells that you're trying to use to heal other places, right? right. Let's say right. you have, you know, some particular brain conditions. You really want the cells to, to get over there or you have particular, you know, you know, injuries or you have osteoporosis, or, you know, whatever condition you have and you're hoping the cells may help, um, then, then there are going to be less cells to get to do what needs to be done. Got it. But more will get to the areas to fix what you just did. Got it. That makes sense. Okay, so we, we kind of went almost backwards in describing all what stem cells are and the different ways that you can get them. What do they do? You know, what is this? I have like a shoulder issue, for example, I've had for a long time and um, it, it, nothing seems to fix it. PMF, I do all the things, lasers, whatever. It gets better for a little while, then it comes back. Um, you know, um, internal organ issues, immune system, like... What are some of the things that you use it for? What are the studies saying? What have you had the best results with? Um, you mentioned, I think, um, TBIs. That is one of the things that you um, specialize in, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes, yeah. So we have to be very careful. I want to just, you know, before I say anything, that we're not making any claims about treating any conditions because that, uh, you know, yes. that will be inviting lots of trouble and I never make claims. So people may come to me suffering from different conditions and what I tell them is how stem cells work and whether or not there has been research showing whether or not stem cell therapy has been helpful for that condition. Um, if there's no, there's no such uh, literature, then I'll, I'll, I'll analyze the pathophysiology of their condition and to see why they're having the, the disease in the first place and, and then and discuss how stem cells work to see if that, you know, how stem cells work can actually work on how their disease is formed. So then... You know, when it comes to how stem cells work, you know, one of the biggest, the most talked about benefit is anti-inflammatory effects. So it has a huge calming effect on inflammation. And when we, when we get older, most of the chronic illnesses have inflammation as the underlying issue. So when you don't calm the inflammation, then repair cannot really happen. Um, as we get older, um, even if you're in perfect health, if they found out that the inflammatory markers gets more and more and more elevated. So you're just having an elevated level of inflammation as you age. You just, you're just getting more and more inflamed. So if you can have an anti-inflammatory effect, then you're calming this underlying driving force of disease and degeneration. So that's one thing. And the other thing is very much talked about, you know, when we talk about stem cells, a lot of times we're talking about mesenchymal stem cells because that's really, you know, what we found to be kind of the engine of re- regeneration. I call, I call them the masters of regeneration. So, so what they do, so MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells, they have huge immune modulatory effects. So if, you know, modern science, science are recognizing just how intelligent our immune system is. It has this ability to monitor, not only just fight against infections, and, but they also get rid of cancer and they help the tissues heal. So they have this, you know, this tremendously complex, right? All these different cells and they all have different functions. Um, and when your immune system's out of whack, that's when you can have autoimmune conditions. You know, diabetes is one, right? So MS, you know, there are there's so many conditions have an autoimmune component that your body this, this high, heightened inflammation is making your body, you know, your immune system going on hyperdrive. So it's attacking different things. It's attacking your own body's tissue. So when you use stem cells 
which has this modulating effect. Basically, if you are your immune system is under active, you know, it's, it's not active enough, then it's making it, uh, you know, heighten it up to be more effective. If it's overactive, then it calms it down. So it's not overly attacking everything there is, you know, including environmental, you know, food. You know, a lot of people have sensitivity to all these food. That's an immune dysregulation. When you have all these food sensitivities, I'm sorry, your immune system is in trouble. So, so immune modulation, that's another one. Um, and then it has all kinds of other really interesting properties. For example, um, it's antifibrotic. So the mesenchymal stem cells actually can help break down scar tissue. And this is why, you know, I've had success when I given stem cells for people with COPD, right? Very tough condition. And the drastic, the rapid recovery of these people on oxygen, on steroid, being able to get off oxygen, go out and, you know, play in the band and sing, you know, drastic improvements um, because it has the ability to break down scar tissue and including liver cirrhosis, right? Very kind of, a, you know, it's... it's, it's, it's the cirrhosis means really the scarring, the fibrosis of, of the liver. So how oh, actually breaking that. that down. Right? Oh, wow. When you break the scar down, then you can have health tissue to, to replace it, right? So, so the antifibrotic is really interesting. And then it also has antimicrobial properties. So it, it not only helps your immune system to fight infection, mesenchymal stem cells themselves can actually secrete antimicrobial peptides. So it directly you know, fight against infection. And then it has these angiogenic properties. So helping forming new blood vessels. So if you, it's no good if you are providing, you're growing new tissue, but there's no blood supply, right? So it actually is helping your blood to form new blood supply. So it's, it's angiogenic. So if you have a heart attack, right, you have stroke. So the angiogenesis can help you form new blood vessels to actually supply the new tissue. That's very cool because hyperbaric oxygen therapy does that as well. Mm -hmm. Before and after my treatment with you, I mean, I do hyperbaric all the time. It's up in the little cottage back there. Um, I can't wait. When I move, I'm going to have my own whole little healing center where I can have you know it in the house or somewhere close to the house. But uh, I've been doing that because I kind of put that together and I didn't know that piece, but I thought, okay, so if I, for a period of time, have all these stem cells that... Um, uh, Dr. Joy put in my body, then I know that I can build new blood vessels and capillaries by doing the hyperbaric. I thought, mm. I want to push all those cells into every inch of tissue in my whole body. Yes. So I've been doing like three, <laughs> one between one and three hour hyperbaric sessions wow. every day. I did one today for 90 minutes and I just go in there and meditate. And, yeah. You know, it's like, it's, it's just a great meditation. Um, great cube. idea. Great yeah. Idea. And it's, it's actually really cool too, because when your brain gets really oxygenated in there from the pressure, I mean, you're breathing like 99% oxygen, but the pressure pushes, pushes it into your plasma. I'm sure you know this, but for those listening, so um, no matter how much breath work you do, you never get oxygen into your plasma. You just saturate your red blood cells. So when that oxygen is going for about 30 minutes, it basically puts you in a really kind of catatonic meditation anyway, even if you're not trying. It's very relaxing. You go parasympathetic. So I love that that's what the stem cells also do. That's pretty cool. That's a good stack. Mm -hmm. That's like pretty, yeah. That's, yeah. that's potent stuff. Right. So that's, that's definitely another one. And and another one is what, what's called per, percrine effect. So it, it just means, you know, endocrine means, uh, you know, something gets secreted into your blood and goes everywhere and produce this, you know, overall effect. A uh, percrine just means in a, in a small vicinity of where the cells are at. So the, 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 the stem cells are able to secrete, you know, growth factors, different signals just for the local environment, help modulate. It's talking, it's, it's bringing other immune cells saying, come here, you know, we need this kind of, this kind of cells to do this work uh, or talking with the local stem cells. So instead of, this is why we don't need the stem cells to become your local tissue because your local tissue have stem cells. They're tissue specific stem cells. Your heart have, you know, heart specific, you know, you, you know, even your brain, you know, they're, they're specific, you know, very young cells that could potentially become neurons. And, and so we, you want to talk with the local stem cells. So you're, when you, give them the right signal, then these cells will come to be and they will replace the tissue. You don't need the, the, the injected stem cells to become your local tissue. So uh, they talk to your local stem cells 
to actually become So this is why I shouldn't be bummed that only 2 to 5% of those cells are going to remain in. Because they come in, flood your system, and do all of that communication. It's giving you massive and powerful information. That's why I have had people who have done all kinds of therapeutic modalities, and they say the stem cell treatment is a game changer because it gives you the final, the engine, all the information. That's the thing. It's massive, intelligent information that's put in your body. And that's what's revolution about it, right? We can do different modalities. Oxygen, okay, that's one factor. That's one thing. And you can do, you know, PMF. Okay, that's one thing. But what, what if you put intelligence? That is holistic. It's like, you know, wow. right? So not that all the other things are not important. I think everything adds to, to the, the final the solution, but you need the, the, the powerful engine to actually drive it. This is why your shoulder is not healing because despite all these things you're doing, right? It's not having just, it doesn't have enough signals to do the final repair. Right. Yeah. So, and then wow. continuing on with more of what stem cells can do. Um, another thing is anti-apoptotic. So, so, so on one hand, it has anti-cancer properties, right? It can kill cancer. It can kill things that, it can not just cancer, but also what's called senescent cells. So that means old and dysfunctional cells. So old cells sitting in your body. As you get older, you get more and more of these senescent cells. So not just being old and not doing their job, they are actually toxic to your body. They secrete different things that are bad for your body and bad for neighboring environment. So you need to remove them to regenerate. But your body, as you get older, you're not good at removing anymore. You know, your, your immune system is not sufficient. Your stem cells are not as smart. And uh, so, so when you put these new signals and then you can actually get these cells, basically kill them off. Once you kill them off, then, the new, and then you give the new cells signals to replace, you know, what has been killed. Then you have regeneration. So I'll give you an example. Um, they've done this uh, experiment on, on uh, this rat that has a condition very similar to the human condition called progeria, which is premature aging. So you, you mean you, I don't know if you've seen you know pictures of could be a young boy, you know, eight nine years old that looked like a little old man because their body, which is they don't have they lack natural killer cells, they could not remove these old cells, so they just sit there. Then they look, they start to degenerate, even though, you know, they're, they're a young boy. So they have a, a animal, I think it's rat or mice, I can't remember. So uh, let's just say rat. They have a similar condition that they are young mice. Uh, let's just say mice. They're young mice, but they look like old mice, right? They, they, their fur is bad. Their posture is bad. You know, they don't move very well. They're, you know, losing their marbles. And then what they did is that they give them NK cell infusion. So, so these natural killer cells, all of a sudden kills off all these old and degenerate cells. And guess what happens to the mice? They start to look young again. They start to, to you know, walk and their fur comes back, their cognition comes back. It's because you're removing what's not functioning. So the stem cells can stimulate your immune system to amplify the natural killer cells, right? But it can also directly kill, these, kill off these senescent cells. So you can regenerate. With the senescent cells, and, and so they're kind of in this dormant stage just hanging around and gumming up the system. Um, w- when those are killed off, do you just excrete them? I mean, do they become like yeah, metabolic you're, you're, waste, you're, yeah, basically? You're, you're, then they, they break down. It's just like anything, right? If you have an infection okay. and you got pus forming, then your body was, you know, try to remove them. So, you know, you, your body has a way of digesting them off and putting them back in the blood and then that circulates into the liver and eventually it. it gets out. Yeah. Side note, have you heard of this stuff? I could have the name wrong. I have it in the other room. It's a, it's a brand name of a new product I got. I think it's, I think the, molecule is called um, spermidine, mm. I think. I'll, I'll show it to you. It's really interesting. But what it does, and there's clinical studies to support this, is also flushes out senescent cells. Mm. Uh, it's made from uh, wheat wheat germ extract. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. But they... They sent me, you know, a bunch of white papers on it and stuff. And I thought, hmm, you yeah. know, do I really need another supplement? <laughs> like how many pills can I take? Well, I do, I do think when you... But that one, when, I'll show it to yeah, you. It's really When you can amplify removal of dysfunctional cells, and then you can promote this anti-aging benefit, right? So, right? so for me, doing stem cell infusions, not only my immune system is optimized, so my... my NK cells, natural killer cells are removing these, these, you know, older cells that are getting older from aging, but these direct 
these transplanted new cells are also removing, you know, killing them off. So guess what? Then my other stem cells, you know, are 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 activated. Then I start to, you know, replace. That's why my skin is better. Uh, that's why, you know, I, I tell people, I said, you know, what you're looking at um, is only, you know, maybe just my face, right? So it looks younger. But what you don't realize is that my entire system, all my bones, my my muscles, my organs, all the internal organs, everything has gotten younger from these IV stem cells I've done. So I'm rejuvenating my entire body. I don't believe, you know, I, I, I'm not against plastic surgery. And, and you know, I, I, I think, you know, that's why I created cream, you know, that is help with beautification. But what I tell people is that, um, you know, a lot of people try to do all these things, you know, on the s- surface of the skin, you know, to texturize, you know, make it better. Um, and I, I tell them, that's great that you're making your skin, you know, you're, you're doing resurfacing, laser treatment. And that's all wonderful. But guess what? You're not nourishing all the, the ligaments, the, the, the muscles, the fat underneath. And, and over time, those would degrade, right? And that's why people droop. You can have the perfect smooth skin, but drooping. How great is that? So then you have to do plastic surgery, which has a risk of you not looking very good, <laughs> not, very, not very natural. So if you have the option to keep your natural beauty, right? Um, you know, why not do it? Why only focus on the surface? That's only going to last you so long, only going to give you so much mileage. But I want to go back to the, the mechanisms of how stem cells work um, because there's still a, a couple more. So um, another thing that, um, that the stem cells can, can do is um, anti-apoptotic. So I was telling you it induces apoptosis for cancer, right? But it can, it's also anti-apoptotic in, in certain circumstances. For example, you just it, radiation injury, right, or chemical, you know, burn, um, what ha- or or stroke. You know, you have uh, ischemia where the blood is shut off, and and then you, you know one p- particular area died. The problem with stroke is that not just the area that dies, the area that dies sends out all these signals, sends out all this information, leak out toxic material to the environment so that it start to killing off the bordering cells. So cells that didn't have to die will end up dying. And guess what these stem cells can do? It can prevent those signals from actually activating these cells to go on program cell death. So you're preserving healthy tissue. That's wild. Right? God, it's so fascinating. They do so much. Yeah. And then another thing stem cells do, which is really cool, is completely different. It's about, it's called mitochondria transfer, which I love um, because, you know, we all know mitochondria is really crucial for health, right? It's the engine of our cells and and of our entire, you know, entire vitality. And as we get older, our mitochondria also decline, decline, decline. So, you know, people do take all kinds of supplements, do different things to revitalize them. But when you give these fresh new stem cells, the stem cells actually give your, your body mitochondria. So they establish this microtubule bridge and they've caught it on electron microscopy. So between the new cells and then your old cells, this, these mitochondria actually walk across the bridge no to get way. into the new cell, the, your, your own cells. Really? So you're giving you a fresh supply of mitochondria. What? Are yeah, you serious? I am serious. So the stem cells, of course, because their cells have their own mitochondria, even when they're yeah, in the they're new umbilical. And fresh. Yeah. Wow. That is so badass. You're getting a mitochondrial upgrade. Yes. Because I got to say, it's been what? Three days since I came to see you, I think. Yes. I feel freaking amazing. <laughs> awesome. Honestly. And it's, I mean, you know, I do so many things to support my my body and my health. And uh, it's my job or part of my job too, you know, right. to explore these things and share them with people and be a kind of a human guinea pig. But sometimes you do so many things, it's difficult to know what's working. I just go, God, I feel amazing. And I, you know, there's so many different metrics, you know, sleep, sex drive, energy, physical strength. If I do, you know, some kind of fitness or something, which is rare. <laughs> I mean, I worked out today, but I don't work out, work out like, a, a, you know, like a gym rat kind of guy would work out. Uh-huh. So there's all these different ways that all sort of gauge, okay, how am I feeling? How am I doing? You know, how much energy do I have basically? And um, it seems to me that the things that really move the needle are the things that help the mitochondria. So I think yeah. that's really interesting because um, two things I've noticed for sure is the pain in my body is has gone down exponentially in the past couple of days. And I've also been seeing this uh, Dr. Dean Howell, who I think his episode will come out after yours. We're going to record out in Austin. 
Um, he does this neuro neurocranio restructuring, really fascinating stuff. He puts these balloons up your nostrils and and inflates them, and then and they expand all the the bones in your skull. Basically, it's it's really really interesting, and that tells your nervous system to realign your bones and all this stuff. So so I've been working with him, and he's really helping my hip. I mean, my hip mobility has gone up. But it's not just that. I really sense there's a reduction in inflammation because I can just tell like when my, you know, the sore spots in my old ass 50 year old body are sore, I know what inflammation feels like and that's not there. And then he's helping me with the range and the structural stuff. So I think that's a really great combination. And we were talking about this the other day, right? You can put stem cells in people's joints all day long, but if they're not fixing their alignment, the way that they move, the functionality of their joint mobility, et cetera. Mm-hmm. You can only get so far. Yeah. So I'm, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm having the experience now of like the stem cell regeneration and also really working with the functionality of the mechanics of the body. I exactly. think that, that combo yeah. is We've I'm got feeling, to integrate different approaches. I'm so, feeling great. Wonderful. This yeah. is why I founded the American Academy of Integrated Cell Therapy because I don't believe that cell therapy is, you know, once and for all is, you know, is fix everything. No, that is very that would be very naive. So you've got to integrate other modalities. You got every everything works as a symphony together. Right. So so yeah, the mechanical issues especially for musculoskeletal issues is really crucial. Um but I, I think, you know, as far as, uh, you know, the pain that you're noticing that's decreased, that's definitely part of the anti-inflammatory effect, you know, v- very fast. I had patients who, you know, before they get off my table, actually, you know, as soon as they got off my table, uh, you know, they say, oh, my pain is 50% gone. You know, it could happen that fast. Wow. Yeah. And then definitely a lot, you know, people within one day, just drastic, drastic reduction in pain. Um, so... So, so, you know, I talk about the, the stages of healing with stem cell therapy. Um, you know, the first stage is this rapid anti-inflammatory effect, you know, stopping the tissue damage, you know, st- stop the toxicity right now, right? That the inflammation is a toxic environment, stopping the toxic environment now. So that can calm the inflammation and then remove debris, the bat cells, you know, get them out of there. So that's the first stage. And that could happen, you know, fairly quick. The second stage is the tissue rebuilding. So that's when, you know, you talk with the local stem cell that started dividing and and making new tissue, the immune cells, you know, they all work together to create a new environment, you know, new tissue growth. That takes more time, right? Weeks um, and, you know, or even more. And then the last stage is the genetic kind of enhancement level. I talk about genetic enhancement really is about helping the DNA to be more healthy because the um, the microRNA that's secreted by the stem cells uh, through exosomes, the microRNA actually has the ability to go across the cell nucleus and actually repair the DNA in a certain sense by, by changing the methylation patterns. So in that sense, it can rejuvenate the DNA. So you can repair and make the DNA healthier. And that effect is going to be much more long-term, right? It could be months or even, you know, you can see the effect, you know, a year down the line. So, so what I want you to do is that you should take a picture, you know, so somehow take a picture, you know, that I want you to take another one. Um, you know, you should do stem cells at least, you know, every six months, if not three, right? And then in three years, take another picture and look at the difference in yourself. Have you noticed this yourself? Yes. So a, a how huge long, difference. How long have you been doing this every three months? Program. Um, four and a half years. Really? Yeah, I can show you the picture when I was forty-three, and now I'm I'm uh, five months away from being fifty. Um, you know, when people say, "Oh, of course you don't age much; you're Asian," I was like, <laughs> "You know, that is not true." Because let me show you my picture because I was well on my aging path, even though I didn't know it at the time. See, when you look at yourself every day, you don't really see. Oh, I age. You you, you don't see it. Usually what happens is people don't notice changes. They don't, don't. And then one day, all of a sudden in the mirror, like, oh boy, you know, I have aged. <laughs> you have been That's aging yeah, yeah. every day. Well, you so, notice it I, when you see someone else, right? You haven't seen, some, like I'll see someone, I don't know, I went to high school with or something and they'll be my age 50. And I'm like, holy shit, this dude looks old as hell. And I think, oh my God, what do I look like? You know? <laughs> yeah. So, so what happened was that, I, you know, when I was 43, I thought I was aging great. And I was aging pretty good, but doesn't mean that I, I wasn't because you could see from my face 
you know, we can't see anything from my body, right? You don't see the internal organs, but you definitely can see in the face that, you know, that there was, um, you know, I had more lines coming up. Um, my, my skin, there's, you know, more discolorations. And then there's this general kind of like, like slight sagging, like very, very subtle, but, but it's there. It's, it's like slight, you know, just reduction of volume. Um, and now if you look at my picture, I'll send you, uh, you know, my, my collage, um, which you can see this. I look at least 15 years younger. Wow. That's, you know, I mean, it just, it's reversal. Oh, the lines are gone. I mean, I don't, I don't wear any foundation. I don't, you know, just what you see. Your skin is, does that's look my great. skin. No joke. Yeah, yeah I, it really just, does. It, it, because it comes from the inside. You know, yes, I do use Chara Omni as the cream, um, which keep my skin really well hydrated and and helps regenerate. But it's really the health comes from the inside. Well, I think that's really interesting. I for some reason never thought about that, but. As we see aging, we just see the outside wrinkles, gray hair, thinning hair, et cetera. But I never think when I look at myself and see myself aging or someone else like, oh man, I bet their liver's in bad shape or, you know, their spleen's probably, you know, decrepit looking too. You know, you don't think about the inside. It's true. Right? So all of our organs are reflecting that breakdown yeah. and, and lack of, of vitality. Do, that's you know, right. You, really don't see, you don't see the wrinkling and, you know, graying of your, your internal organs. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, was there any, cause I want to, I want to make sure in our, in I think our, you mentioned another thing about yeah. differences, you know, a bit, a between what we do here and what people do overseas. So oh, I just yeah, want to yeah, yeah. let's, answer. Let's do that. And then I want to get into the ketamine stuff before. We okay. Close, yeah. I just want to answer that question. So, so what happens with, um, you know, what people can do overseas that, um, that we cannot do in the U S um, it's not that we cannot do it in the U S is that if you want to do it in the U S um, if you want to grow the cells to a big number and then give it to people, it has to be under uh, this clinical study. It's, it's, a, it's, it's called IND, Investigational New Drug. And that's a very involved process. You have to go through animal testing. You have to do you know a lot of things. There are a lot of basically uh, things that you have to overcome in order to obtain uh, that approval of that clinical study. So just because you want to do it doesn't doesn't mean that it can happen. Um, so that effectively is putting a stop to a lot of people who want to do this, right? You can grow cells. Even if you grow your own cells, um, the FDA said, no, if you have put the cells into an incubator and you even if it's from your own body, you grow them into a large number, uh, there could be changes that happen to those cells, which is true. you know. Or if you use enzyme because they can get your fat and they will try to digest the connective tissue that's encasing or, 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 or blocking, you know, the, the, the stem cells. If you don't use collagenase, you know, that, that breaks down collagen, those cells are kind of trapped. So you don't get as many cells. So you, if you put collagenase is to break down the collagen. All of a sudden you're freeing up all these cells. You can get 10 times as many cells from the same tissue. But the problem is the FDA says, well, if you use collagenase, that means that you, there's a potential that you're altering the cells. Which is true because not only do they digest the connective tissue, but they can also digest surface receptors of your cells. So they are changing your cells in a certain way. So I, I do agree with the FDA. You know, then you need to, more investigation. You know, you're changing the cells. So what we use from the birth tissue is completely unaltered, right? For whatever that's from the placenta, from the umbilical cord, you carefully mechanically dissect the cells out. You, 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 know, you don't use any chemicals, any enzymes, and you don't grow them in any way, you just cryopreserve them and then wait until you need them and then you put in the body. So, so that's what's called minimal manipulation. So as long as you're doing that um, right now in the US, then you're allowed to provide the cells um, um, for homologous use. So whatever the cells was doing in the body before, it has to be doing something that's very similar. And when you start to grow cells in, in massive numbers, then... Um, you know, the, the, you have to go through the clinical trial. That's why all these companies decide to go overseas, which where they don't have the same kind of restrictions. It's a lot, you know, there are countries that have a lot looser rules. Um, so what they do is that they will take the cells, whatever source it is, could be from fat, from bone marrow, from uh, umbilical cord, and then they separate the cells out and they put them in an incubator and grow the cells to huge numbers. So, so they can grow them to really vast numbers. What they do is that from a small number of cells, they can grow all the cells and then they can divide them up, right? And give to patients. So they're, it's a very cost-saving method, right? So when I give a small number of cells, 
what happens is that when it's in the body, it will grow to massive numbers, right? So that's the original amount of cells. Um, but when you put them in the in a uh, culture and you put them in an incubator, they do grow to these massive numbers. But what happens is that when you try to grow cells artificially like that, um, the way the stem cells divide, um, unless it's in perfect, perfect conditions, they often divide, you know, there's been research done, often divide as one daughter cells one daughter cell, which, which means the cells is further differentiated, and one stem cell. So there's one identical stem cell and then one daughter cell. The daughter cell has, you know, other things that's going on that's, you know, just, you know, that's different from the original cell. So they've gained new function. So then if every time, you, let's say you have 10 cells, and each time the cells divide, they have one daughter cell and one original cell, right? And then you divide again, that original cell can only make one of itself, right? And then you have one daughter cell. By the end, um, and the daughter cells also divide, right? By the end, you have way more daughter cells than the original stem cells. So you're, you're like a small number of stem cells surrounded by these daughter cells. And then they divide those up and give it to people. So what you're receiving, yes, the daughter cells may still be premature. Um, you know, they're still, you know, immature cells but they're more differentiated, which means that they express more surface receptors and there's more potential to cause adverse reaction because the more surface receptors they have, the more they can express individuality. That means, you know, if it's, if John's cells, you know, put into Susan, uh, then, then John's cells start to become more of John, you know, with John characters and Susan's body may not recognize and may not like it. So then you run the risk of that. That's This is one reason that, there's more side effects that's seen when you do do it that way, and then a lot of times they have to divide the treatment into into several uh, portions. You know, within the same, you know, some places do it within a week, um, and they would give three infusions. But sometimes, and I've heard from patients who have come back from these clinics that by the second infusion and third infusion, they're getting more and more reaction. Guess what? Your body just got primed with these with these foreign you know, expressions, right? So now you give the second impression, you know, infusion, your body's recognizing, oh, I know this is not me. I've already been mobilized and now I can attack. So your body's having more this, this you know, rejection. Um, so this, this is why I'm not a big fan of it. Unless you can control the condition perfectly, you can show that these cells are absolutely still original mesenchymal stem cells. But there's only so many generations you can, you can do without the cell degrading. So after about four or five generations, they start to really not, their, their capabilities and their original vibrancy would decline. So it's not like you can just grow the cells on trees. They just keep doing whatever they do. No, after a few generations, they will start to decline in the quality of their progenies. And, and you were saying the other day that more is not necessarily better. And that would be the reason then, right? Because you're, you're not getting those... Right. Like real, original, exactly. undifferentiated stem cells. Exactly. So you might think, well, I could go get a million stem cells in one IV instead of 100,000 or whatever. But exactly. how many... But they don't realize that 100,000 right. can grow into a billion inside the body right. when it's the perfect in incubator. You know, there's no better incubator, you know, than a human body, the human environment for Got a human it. cell. All right, cool. All right, good. I'm glad we covered that. Okay, so with the remaining time we have here, uh, which is not that much because I have a uh, moving happening here, <laughs> and uh, anyone that listens to this show knows that I could talk all day, but uh, I would be remiss to not cover one of the other modalities that you do in your clinic. The clinic's called Thea, right? Right, T H E A. Yeah. yeah. Um, in Chatsworth, yes. is that where we were? Yeah. yeah, the land of horses and the San Fernando horses, and a lot of boulders, a lot of beautiful rock formations. Yeah, yeah, a lot um, of old uh, Western movies are filmed in Chatsworth. Yeah, yeah. right, right, and um, and in the eighties and nineties, I'm not sure anymore. A lot of uh, pornographic films as well. <laughs> That's true. It's supposed to be the porn capital of the world. <laughs> I think it is. Yeah, <laughs> not your office though. It's all in the up and up. Um, but you, when you were giving me the tour, you were really excited about the things you're doing with ketamine therapy, and I've used ketamine for meditation and things like that. I've not yet done a therapist-led uh, uh, session, although I, I probably will with Dr. David Rabin, uh, a guy who's been on the show and specializes in that uh, th uh, therapist-assisted ketamine therapy, I think it's called. But anyway, uh, you showed me around and you're proud you're doing some remodeling and stuff. And then you had like your ketamine rooms and one of them had an inversion table and then <laughs> one of them had the, you know, like a PEMF mat and then a red light 
device that hangs over you while you're on the mat. And then there was another room with another red light dome that goes on your head. And so you're doing some pretty cool stuff. Now, I'm a believer in ketamine therapy. I mean, I have a very close friend, went to a place in uh, West LA called Field Trip and did a series of, I think, six or seven therapist-led sessions, totally cured of addiction, quit smoking, um, depression gone, just amazing success story. And I've yes. not, I've not done it, you know, that intentionally. Just I just have meditated with it and things like that. Uh, but he really had some profound changes, and so I think he's just sitting in a chair talking to a therapist with an IV or maybe an intramuscular shot of uh, this ketamine. But you're doing some really crazy stuff out there, and then you indicated you're not just doing it with patients that you see, but that you've also done a lot of journeys yourself and have indicated that it really has opened you up spiritually. Yes. I, and so I I'm, think... I'm curious kind of how you got into it and then and then maybe what ketamine does to the brain and what are some of those unique stacking of different modalities that you're using with it? I think ketamine, you know, as an incredible therapeutic modality, um, it's very unique um, because it's the you know, it's in the dissociative category of medications uh, and it's been used as anesthetic for, you know, decades, you know, for, for, for I, I think for, yeah, 70 years almost. Um, so it, it's one of the safest anesthetic agents and is on the WHO list of essential medications. So it's a really crucial medication. Um, and what it does is that it works on the level of consciousness, right? Dissociated. So it works on your consciousness and is the first, is the, the well, yeah, it's the first um, basically, um, uh, you can call it psychedelic um, or, or hallucinogenic or whatever you want to call it. But with, with that kind of property, the first the medication that's, um, um, it, it, that's allowed for, for, for use for not for that particular purpose, but for uh, the treatment of depression, for treatment resistant depression. Um, so in, in that sense is, is groundbreaking um, because it, it works on so many different levels. I think um, a lot of doctors, even doctors who are doing ketamine therapy, they get so caught up with the traditional chemistry. You know, um, I, I, one thing I want to talk about is that I think medicine needs to move beyond chemistry and into physics. So uh, we're no longer in the billiard ball, you know, you know, this molecule ran into that molecule and it does this, you know, the receptors and the lock and key. It, it, and that is limiting. That's very limiting because you're not talking about what about the other level? How about we utilize knowledge in quantum physics? So we've got to stop just being pure chemists. We've got to learn to become physicists if you want to be truly effective and you go, want to go to the next level of healing. So, so ketamine has the ability. So what most doctors are not talking about how ketamine can help a person is that it's not talking about anything more than just receptors. Different receptors, yes, it works on receptor levels. It's true. An MDA receptor and this and that uh, gets very complex, but it also changes brain waves. So one of the really powerful brain waves th that, that it's hard to get to is the gamma wave. So we have, you know, four level of other brain waves, but the gamma wave is associated with this, this incredible sustained focus and expanded consciousness. And, and they've compared um, the, the wave of the, the gamma wave, the, the gamma wave um, presentation with people that have met long-term meditators and meditated at least 10,000 hours in our lives. It's very similar. It looks very similar. So there's a level of consciousness expansion that that can help things in a, from a completely different level. So we all know how good meditation is and meditation can generate that high level brainwave and ketamine can do that too. And that's not talked about. I didn't know about. that. That's yeah, crazy. That's not even talked about by almost all the ketamine uh, uh, doctors that I've met. You know, it's unfortunate. You know what I really want? My own QEEG machine <laughs> because I'm always so curious when I explore these different... Uh, medicines and different types of meditation. I'm always so curious what brainwave state I'm in. The only thing I can track is, I don't have my aura ring with me, but today I did a, a meditation in my oxygen chamber, a, like an hour and a half Joe Dispenza one. And I hit a pretty deep state and I tracked my HRV and it was, I went up to like 57 or something, which is above maybe 10 points above my nighttime baseline. I thought, oh, that's pretty good because it felt pretty deep. And so that was interesting, but I'd really be curious to see 
as they do in the dispenser retreats, you know, he's got a whole group of scientists in the back and everyone's hooked up to EEGs and, uh, and they can tell when someone hits gamma mm. and they'll hit high gamma, like 400 standard deviations outside of normal, like insane supernatural experiences. Mm. And these people are not doing any kind of psychedelics or anything. It's yes. just, they use the breathing techniques and the things that he's refined over the years. But I'm just someone that really loves to quantify. And um, I've had different experiences. Like I was telling the other day with uh, 5-MeO DMT, which has been absolutely for me the most transformative experiences of my life, hands down, um, especially recently. And one of the things that it does too is produces high gamma very reliably. But I had no idea that ketamine did yes. that. That's so interesting. Yes, yes. It's fascinating. And subjectively thinking about it, when you go into a really deep space in ketamine where you know, you lose the sensation of the body and the dissociative effect kicks in. And then you go into that really still place of the void or that quantum field. That makes perfect sense because it's actually very similar to, you know, like you said, different types of meditation, all the different tools to take us there. Yes. So that is badass. So anyway, um, <laughs> totally interesting. And for those listening, we're not to make it clear, we're not talking about like going to a rave and going into a K hole and like partying and no ketamine. And, you know, you know what, it's a what different deal. I, I do believe you know it needs to be done. You know, using safe source, right? I because I, I heard so many people who have done ketamine. I was like, and then they didn't have a good experience. Like, How did you do it? And they're like, well, I I, I ingested it. You know, I uh, or I snorted it. You know, I so so they, they were using all these things that really were not the pure form and, and, and the setting and the, the, they don't know how to dose it. And, you know, d- people do not have a good experience. If you use really pure form and you're putting it directly into the contact with your blood flow, right? Either intramuscular or even people do, do intranasal, like, you know, I guess they cook because it goes directly into the blood. Um, I, I'm not a big fan. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that will get you the same kind of effect as um, IV ketamine. Um, or even intramuscular. I think um, the getting directly into the bloodstream and, and a sustained experience is extremely therapeutic because what we have with ketamine is something that we have not had before, which is the helping the rewiring of the brain. So it changes your neural network. And, and it does it, yeah, it, it does, you know, secrete, you know, enhance the, the, the secretion of brain derived neurotropic factors. So it can help enhance the, the synapse formation. So your brain actually can establish, you know, a, a different kind of network or repair old dysfunctional ones. Um, and, but the, the effect can be so rapid because a person could be suicidal and within a session, it's not suicidal. I mean, if you take medications, it would take weeks to work. Um, and this can take an hour or, or even less to work. And, and, and that kind of relief of suffering, I think it's, 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 it's so profound and, and, and so beautiful because I, I can't think of anything that's, that's more painful than psychological suffering, than not just couldn't, cannot, not being able to feel joy, but only feel despair. So if we can help get the person out of it, and 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 free them and then allow rebuilding right and i do believe ketamine and stem cells can work can help each other right the, the brain one can help you rewire the faulty network the other one can help the tissue to be less inflammatory and can help with the, the growth of the new network wow so cool in your subjective experience um being a doctor on yourself with the ketamine <laughs> What uh, what have been some of the net benefits in terms of your consciousness and your, you know, peace of mind or quality of life? Well, one of the big thing is that um, it pretty much shattered my ego. Um, so I had a pretty healthy ego um, growing up, um, like a little too robust, and it got you know more and more subdued as I became more and more mature. Um, I started to you know really, you know put myself in other people's shoes and, you know, the empathy and, you know, be more loving, more open. Um, but, you know, the sense of, you know, I have to do this, I'm going to accomplish, I, this I, I, I. Once you start to understand more of who you really are, then that I is not, doesn't matter very much because you can never see things clearly if you are at this level. You can only see things more clearly when you're standing above it 
I mean, the picture cannot form clearly, right? When you are right in it. So you have to get above it and then you can see the picture. So that gave me a perspective, understanding of what I really am. And I feel this is the first time I feel I have a chance at true happiness and sustained happiness. You know, I'm not completely there, but I'm working my way to, toward it. I remember um, about a year ago, I was saying to a good friend of mine, I said, I just want to be happy all the time. I just, I want to be ecstatic all the time. I just want to be so filled with joy. The moment I wake up until the moment I go to bed, I just want to be happy. And I was like, but it's not like that. I'm not happy, happy all the time. And she said, well, nobody can be like that, can be happy all the time. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I really want that. That's what I want. And <laughs> this, I feel this is the first time I'm, I'm having a chance at it, that I could I have a chance to be actually ecstatic at all times. And that's what happened with people who are more enlightened, who have, that they can live in that state of bliss all the time, right? And that's what I want. And I feel by expanding your consciousness by looking at things from a certain height, then you're able to understand why you're here and what's out there, how that's related. And you know what, then if you understand your purpose and then you understand the source of certain greatness, then you may be able to enjoy something that there's a sense of, you know, you know, joy and, and bliss that you just could not either grab or sustain. Yeah, that sense of uh, expanded awareness and objectivity, right? Where you, in the ketamine journeys and meditation and whatever experience brings you there, what I find is is I get better at being in that observer witness perspective during the experience. But with practice, you can actually be sitting here having a conversation and still be the witness observing the personality Luke and the personality Joy having this interaction, right? And that's when it gets really fun. Because then the little, you know, the mic breaks, we knock the tea over, the dog farts, I drop my notes, <laughs> the camera breaks, you know, whatever, light, like life uh, happens in, the, in this realm. And it's kind of like, haha, I don't know. I find that I'm, the more that I enter into these realms, the more I'm able to kind of wear the world like a loose garment and just kind of slough off anything that's not in my highest good in terms of the way that I feel and the way that I think. It's, it's really, yeah. it's, it's, and, it and really I, is the answer in whatever route you go. And I think... Things yeah. like ketamine, as you describe, and when you look at the function it has on the brain, I mean, how long would you have to meditate to get into high gamma? You know what I mean? Like, you can go get a shot in your lots. butt and go into gamma. Like, I'll take it. You know, lots, lots. yeah, I know, I know. Um, I've tried to meditate um, since I was eighteen years old, and I tried and tried and tried, tried. I it just, it was very frustrating. I was like, how come I can't get there? I can't, I just can't. People, because I've read books, people were talking about these incredible experiences, these visions, and you can't, you won't believe it. And I was like, I don't see it. I don't see it. I just like, where is it? And now I know exactly what they were talking about. This is yeah. incredible. I mean, people who have throughout history have had these profound experiences and I didn't believe them because I couldn't experience them. And now I know, oh my God, it's there. And the cool thing is that now, what's really fun is that now I know who I am. I'm having this separation between me, my essence, like this incredible, incredible thing, um, and joy. You know, joy is right now, you know, it's th this time. But, but the me is not joy. So I, I do have to integrate right now. And then it's hard not to integrate because this, this world is so energy dense. It just sucks you in. So it's, it's, it's hard not to be to have it integrated. But I think for too many people, it's so integrated, so locked in that, that there's no, no separation. They cannot, they don't even know their essence. All they know is, you know, me, you know, you know, Joe or, 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 or you know, or, or whatever, you know, uh, Jack. So they, they can't, um, they, they, they don't, they, they can't sense the true essence anymore because they're locked in. And that's what I'm hoping by, you know, the evolution of, us as a species, that we can start to really be able to unlock and, and feel who we really are. What are the three or four different uh, modalities that you stack in the clinic? There was one that I didn't see you mentioned. You're using, putting people under ketamine and then using vibration therapy to work through physical pain and physical traumas and stuff. Explain some of the different things you're doing there, like the inversion 
table on ketamine sounds insane to me. <laughs> like like flooding your your you put ketamine in your bloodstream, then flood your brain with the ketamine that's in your bloodstream hanging upside down. That even to me, and I'm pretty hardcore, was like I was like, oh shit, she's not playing. That's hardcore. Well, the reason that came about was because I found out from brain imaging that I have traumatic brain injury. Um, uh, okay. Probably since I was probably a teenager. I don't even know. Maybe I was dropped as a baby. But um, um, so I was determined to heal my brain, uh, which I did to a great extent. Within two months, I did a repeat imaging um, that showed drastic improvement. You know, many areas of um, uh, lesions that actually disappeared and, and a lot of them have significant improvement. So, I, I mean, I made drastic changes within two months when um, most people do not get a repeat brain scan, you know, less than six months later because there's no modality that can, you know, get people improvement. You know, you, it makes no sense to do a repeat scan in two months. So I was determined to heal my brain. And because I know the capacity of ketamine to rewire the brain and for neurogenesis, so to actually regenerate the neural system, and if I can enhance blood flow and I can use energy therapy because there's certain energy like red light therapy, that's another thing I, I incorporate that can help with the blood flow and it can promote healing. And then, you know, with the neurogenesis, right, with the, the ketamine rewiring, then I can really just, you know, things can come together. So the inversion table, of course, you know, inversion has been not only is great for your musculoskeletal system, but it's great for brain health and, and tremendous for brain health. You know, we, you know, this is poorly perfused and we're always erect like this. So when you invert and throughout history, you know, people have done that. You know, a lot of um, old monks, you know, that, that, that when they do headstands, it's great for their brain and for their mental acuity. Um, so, so that really kind of came about because I, I was determined to heal my brain fast. And, uh, Me and it too. worked. Me too. That's so cool. So do you ever do the the red light helmet while hanging upside I down? I think that's too, that's too <laughs> complex. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> you make it complex and then my brain's like, how could I make it even more hardcore? <laughs> um, and then, and then the other one you had in there was this really nice PEMF mat. Yeah, yeah. Which is kind of it's, it's a light, light therapy. So I got near infrared light. I got PEMF, and there's also um, you know some other um, you know there's gemstones, and then I have you know a face thing that help with you know a kind of uh, you know facial rejuvenation, and then so the full body light rejuvenation. So so you got all the frequencies, you know, the therapeutic light frequencies that can help you rejuvenate. Um, I, I just, um, so I have done it, you know, myself. It's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, I'm definitely going to get in there and try all that stuff next time I come back to LA. Um, and then what about the working with the, um, uh, the body with the vibration therapy and all that? And yeah, so cause- when you are just like, I, I, I'm not comfortable. Um, for example, I have, I've had knots um, in my back because I'm a, a little bit high strung and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a very, very, you know, I'm, you know, I, it can be tense at times. So my muscles were tensing up. So between my shoulder blades, I have these massive knots because I've worked with various massage therapists and they're like, well, this is some of the biggest ones I've seen. And so it takes a lot. I don't know if you ever worked on knots. It takes a lot, a lot of repeated work and then still it's, ne- it's there and it's not it just you know, they're very difficult to get rid of, you know, it's your muscles because it's a whole new memory between your muscle and the nervous system and it is clamped down besides the scar tissue. So what happens when you're on ketamine uh, is that your muscles will relax to the point that you cannot do it just when you're fully conscious. You, you, you're not there. So then you have a chance of going deeper and breaking down the, the you know, scar tissue or the, the, the tight knots. You're breaking them down painlessly and then because of the rewiring of the neural network, the neurons and the muscle, the nerve endings and the muscles, it could reestablish new communication. So within a few weeks, the, the, the big knots between my shoulder blades was obliterated. They're gone. Yeah. Wow. It was pretty incredible because, you know, used to be anyone, if they'd give me massage and touch between my shoulder blades, I'll be like, yes, stay right there. Yeah. That's that. I call them my, the center of my universe. Just, just, just work on those spots. And then after, you know, I did the body work on, on me with ketamine and then if someone touched between my shoulder blades, it feels like they're touching like anywhere else on my back. It, it's no different. It was like, well, that's okay. Just, you know, just touching, just, you know, like anywhere else. Um, so also when you are, let's say you have shoulder injury, right? And you may have certain areas that, that are clamped down, are scarred up and, and are not really releasing. 
the ketamine will allow you to relax to such extent uh, where whoever that's working on you can get much deeper into your tissue. And that's what, um, you know, one of the chiropractors that I've been working with, and he was amazed. He said, he said, you know, this, I can get so much deeper into someone. That's very cool. Yeah. Wow. I like that. I'm, I'm going to try that actually. Um, I think when I uh, move here, I'm going to set up a little healing center and have a massage table and stuff. And, and that'll be one of the first orders of business is to get some awesome. body work done on ketamine. Yes. Yes. Cause you, I, you know, you I was thinking about sometimes I, 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 look at the limited range of motion I have in certain joints and then have been told that when you're under full anesthesia, you're completely flexible because your nervous system isn't holding on, trying to protect itself in those yes. ways that limit your range of motion because yes. you got hurt before, you overextended, whatever. So I've always had that in mind, like, huh, there's got to be a way to have your body manipulated when you're in that state. But obviously I can't go under anesthesia unsupervised. And what am I going to do? Go to the hospital with the masseuse and go put me under? It's not practical, but this is a way perhaps to hack that. Yeah, um, yeah. You know. We monitor your vital signs. First of all, ketamine is extraordinarily safe. Um, it's being used, I mean, for, <clears throat> for, for pediatrics, you know, pediatric use, you know, animals, um, but emergency settings, they've done a, a study where they did an emergency setting because, you know, when the paramedics go pick somebody up, that's really, really agitated. They can give them a intramuscular ketamine and they calm down right, right away. And, uh, I, at one time they accidentally gave the person 16 times the, the upper limit. And the person was still fine. And it was, it was funny. It was just reported in the literature, but it's extraordinarily safe. Right. Yeah. When, when, you know, to clarify, when practiced with the, you know, a licensed whatever. Oh yeah. I do not <laughs> yeah. ever. Yeah. Please do not go out there and just, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> and also it's, when, when it's done in a clinically supervised setting, um, it's not addictive. So when people worry, oh, what if this is addictive? No, it's not addictive. So if you see literature, show me evidence. Um, I, you know, that is more of a hype. It's not real. It's funny you mention that because I was talking about uh, ketamine on one of my podcasts and someone sent me a message on Instagram and said, hey, this is very irresponsible of you. I was addicted to ketamine and now you're promoting it or something like that. And I thought, oh, huh, that's weird. I mean, I guess one can get addicted to anything. They say weed's not addictive and I was totally addicted to weed when There's I was no a kid. There's no physical dependence. So you don't, you don't get this withdrawal symptom and craving. You don't get that. You may Got be it. psychologically dependent on it because you, you feel, oh, I, I think I'll do better or I, I need to relax. So psychologically, you, you want to do it, but not because physically that you, that, 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 that there's not withdrawal like, symptoms. Not like alcohol, cocaine, opiates, et cetera. Okay, oh. cool. Good to know. All right. Well, that's it, man. This is my last official interview. Oh my God. In the city of Los Angeles. Oh, so thank you. A conclusion of a it's, wonderful, yeah, wonderful journey. It's been, a, it's been a great 32 years and a couple more days I'll be out of here. By the time this comes out, I'll already have moved. Um, but, then we'll uh, have to do it through Zoom. Well, no, I'm gonna. I'll come back. I mean, when I say my last Los Angeles interview, I'm I'm gonna come back and record, and we can do a follow up. But my last one here in the studio, Aww. I already took the wall down. You know, I had this, uh, you know, Aww. like reclaimed wood wall, and I'm like, wow, the video looks different. It's so white in here. Oh, <laughs> so thank you for uh, thank you for coming. And there is one last question I have for you, and that is, who have been three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life and your work that you could share with us? Oh, geez, three teachers. I can't think of any one particular. I mean, there's some philosophy philosophers. You know, I I think I definitely resonate with uh, you know Lao Tzu. Um, you know the the Taoist, um, the 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 guru that started Taoism. You know, talking about being in tune with nature, and um, you know, not fighting, not fighting the force, but you know, use the flow of nature. And, um, and just, um, he has a way of stepping outside of the, just the, the bustles, you know, of life and take a look beyond, you know, I just, I love that feel of serenity and, um, and the same thing with Buddha. Um, and I, I think it's very enlightening when he is so willingly, um, well, he's through his meditation and he realized he, he's accepting suffering as life. That life is composed of suffering that just accept it, but it's all empty. He's talking about this void, right? It's all a void. I think the void is that this particular realm, what we're dealing with, really, it's in the end, it's a play. It's a play to help us grow. 
help our, our essence to grow. So, so this temperate, no, much, no matter how much suffering you see, no matter how heartbreaking it is, just know it's temporary. This is theater for us to grow. Um, so, you know, I, 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 and then recently I just, I was looking at uh, Confucius. So funny. So Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism are the three religions or three philosophies that has dominated the Chinese society. That's really, if you ask what's Hmm. the Chinese, like what, what do they believe in? The Chinese religion or philosophy is really composed of, it's an integral part of these three. So Confucianism, which I'm actually a descendant of Confucius. I'm a 73rd generation. So I have a, you know, affinity for it. But although I, I did not like him for a long time because he talked about how women is subordinate to men. I really hated that. <laughs> I was just really upset with him. But, but he, Patriarchal, yeah. spiritual teacher, yeah. Yeah, but he's a man of great compassion because mm-hmm. he grew up, uh, you know, during the time of, of 2,500 years ago, the tremendous chaos, wars, you know, all these little you know, countries and regions. I mean, that's before, this is before China was united into one country. They were all fighting each other. People are dying or just misery, right? People are cheating each other. So he decided, you know, there must be a way of living harmoniously, harmoniously together. That, and he, he found the way is to resort to our higher self. He talks about that as a superior man, you know, that, that we can be the superior man, you know, instead of just allowing ourselves to be, to run amok with our basic, you know, needs and, you know, our greed and animalistic instinct that we resort to the higher self. And that is beautiful. And that formed part of the Chinese philosophy of how the country, how people are treating each other and how the country is run. The rulers have to be malevolent. It's about resorting to our higher self. So through rituals that they're all, all re, you know, kind of calling on the higher self, how to be a better man, man, be the superior man. And I think that took tremendous compassion, right? When nobody wanted to listen to you, he, he traveled for 13 years to all these countries trying to persuade rulers to adopt his philosophy. And pretty much no one did. He mm. thought he failed when he died, but it turned out that he became revered and for the next, you know, almost 2,500 years, that became the dominant philosophy. And he became the most revered uh, person. Like his palace, the Confucius palace is the biggest palace outside of Forbidden City. So he, the whole family is very much revered. So, um, so I, I'm gaining a new respect for him because it takes so much compassion of love of humanity to try to promote that there's a better way of living. So, um, yeah. So, That's awesome. Thank you for those three. Yeah, I, oh, didn't, I don't know much about Confucius, but um, I am a little familiar with the Tao. And that's, I mean, I always, I just, I love paradox, you know, and the Tao is all paradox. Yes. You yes. know, because life is, if it's anything, it's paradoxical, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so thank you for the recommendations. And uh, where can we find your websites? How oh, can yes. people find your clinic? The Chara Omni cream that I'm obsessed with. <laughs> the Chara Omni, you can just you get online as uh, just charaomni.com. So it's Chara, C-H-A-R-A. Omni, A-M-N-I, no, O-M-N-I. So charaomni.com. And chara is the Greek word for joy. So um, it's, it's a, so the company I found at Chara Biologics that provides stem cell companies to doctors throughout the country, actually. Um, it's really the, you know, what I want to bring is more joy to the world. And I think there's joy in healing. So Chara, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, it's not just average happiness, it's actually joy. Um, so Chara Omni is a cream and, um, and you can find me from, um, you know, at, at our clinic. So the clinic is Thea Center for Regenerative Medicine. So it, the, the website is just Thea C-R-M. So T-H-E-A-C-R-M.com. And um, yeah, so you can, you know, our office, you, if you want to call us, it's 818-356-8232. And uh, we, uh, we love helping anybody that wants to experience these cutting edge treatment modalities. Awesome. Well, thank you uh, for coming on the show and uh, thank you for treating me the other day and giving me the tour of the office. You guys are doing some really cool stuff. Just when I think I had Los, Los Angeles on lock, I'm like, I know all the great spots. And it's like, oh, there's another one that I didn't know yeah. about. So I'm really glad to meet you and to experience uh, your stem cell treatments, man. I'm excited. And um, 
when I'm well healed enough, I'm going to come out here every six months and oh, do it again. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, so yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it. That All would right. probably be the best investment that you will ever make because, you know, I, I talk with people and, and, oh, there was one patient, he comes to see me every three months. He said, man, this is the best inv- investment ever. I'm investing in myself. He said, my friends that are investing stock is like, you know, who cares? This is your best investment. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. You're so welcome. It's been a blast. We cover a lot of grounds. We sure did. Yeah. Thank you, Luke.